What do Buddhists believe and how to share the gospel with them? Well, it's gonna require that you ask good questions and be willing to listen. So let's talk about the seven worldview questions and how Buddhists would answer them. And let's consider how we can use that as an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's not a time zone in which he's not being praised. Listen to me, there is not a moment since the resurrection of Jesus where there's not someone somewhere declaring that Jesus saved. I want to help you walk through, and really there's going to be two schools of thought within Buddhism, two primary schools of thought, help walk you through these seven worldview questions, how a Buddhist would answer them, and give us opportunities, hopefully, to help them dissect their own worldview that we would be able to share the gospel with our Buddhist neighbors, co-workers, and friends. You say, well, I don't live around a lot of Buddhists. Uh, well, let me tell you this. The nations are coming here. They are here. Now, we can talk about the legitimacy of immigration policies or border walls or whatever. We can talk about that another time. The point is, however a Buddhist neighbor showed up in your neighborhood, however a Buddhist co-worker, doesn't matter. If they're there for however long they're here, whether they're citizens, whether they're tourists, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whether you're traveling to a Buddhist country, there's an opportunity for us to make an eternal difference in someone's life. It means we're going to be able to, means we need to be able to ask good questions not just random questions, but let's work through these seven worldview questions so that we can understand what our Buddhist neighbor and coworker believes to give us an opportunity to share the gospel. Well, within Buddhism, there really there's there's three main groups. One of them, you know, less popular than the others, but let's talk about each three so that we can try to answer these seven worldview questions. First of all, there's the Theravada school. Uh, this is uh, probably the less popular, more when you think of the priest, there's the Mahayana school of Buddhism, and then what we know is Zen Buddhism. Now, we think about these different schools of thought, I want you to recognize that you, you don't necessarily need to know per se where someone lines up within Buddhism to share the gospel with them. I'm just going to give you a general understanding of their beliefs so that we can have an opportunity to help walk them through the dismantling of their own worldview that we'll have an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. First question, what is prime reality? That is what's really real. For us as Christians, it's the triune God. Uh, he created everything. The Bible starts out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the Theravada school, believes that there is neither a personal God nor a spiritual or material substance that exists by itself as ultimate reality. That's completely opposed to what we believe, complete opposite. So when you're saying, do you believe in God? You're gonna get no. Now in the Mahayana school, this is gonna be probably your everyday practitioner. Uh, this is gonna be the, the Buddhist on the street probably. So this particular line of thinking does not deny that God exists, but says that gods are only temporary beings that attained heaven using the same virtues as any human disciple. In other words, Oh, the gods were once where you are. Gods are not worshipped, do not represent the basis for morality, and are not the givers of happiness. The ultimate reality in this form of Buddhism is nothing but a transcendent truth which governs the universe and human life. Of course, you can understand as you hear as you begin to hear these answers how different. Buddhism is from Christianity. So we're not going to be able to just run in and say, do you want to go to heaven? We're going to have to unpack because for, for them, heaven isn't the same thing. Of course, you're going to have one school of thought that, that heaven's not even a thing. Uh, and then, of course, how you get there, do you want to be there? These are a whole host of questions. Uh, Zen Buddhism holds to this. There's one impersonal element that constitutes reality. You're going to see some borrowing here from, from Hinduism, or Hinduism borrows from Buddhism. There's going to be some overlap as they certainly have encountered, each of these religions have encountered each other for you know several thousand years. You're going to have some overlap. These are both Eastern religions, so it should be a, no surprise. In the same way that you would find some points of contact, some similar points of contact between monotheistic faiths. So number two, what is the nature of external reality? That is the world around us. As Christians, we believe that God created everything. 
and that humans are uniquely created in his image. For uh, Buddhists, generally speaking, here, you're going to see this is pretty universal in their understanding. The universe is only a product of transitory factors of existence which depend functionally upon each other. In other words, you, you don't have, since you don't have an ultimate reality, one governing, if you will, God or deity, everything is, on, it's almost like uh, everything is on a collision course and its interactions are happening. It, you got to see almost this randomness about it. There can't be something intentional happening here because there's not, there's not a, a single being guiding any of it. Uh, let me quote from uh, the Buddha. Now, when I say quote from the Buddha, I don't know that this was actually said by the Buddha, but we have this in some of the Buddhist writings. Allegedly says, the world exists because of causal actions. All things are produced by causal actions and all beings are governed and bound by causal actions. This is going to be important to understand in Buddhism, is this idea of cause and effect. Okay? Fixed by the pen of its actual shaft. Why, why is that important? Because when we, th we think of Buddhism, we see the wheel. And this, there's center point here. So in in Buddhism, that center point, if you will, is what will, will, in a sense, govern and guide all the principles of Buddhism from there. So external reality is, is chaotic in Buddhism at its core, yet we're supposed to make sense of this chaos, and making sense of this chaos really begins with this idea of detaching from it. You'll see some similarity there in Hinduism. I don't want to get too much in that. We'll talk a little bit more about this idea of detaching and removing oneself from the effects of the world around you. Because essentially the idea is something happens, it affects you, uh, so that's it becomes the cause. It affects you, and you, you have to create a point where that doesn't happen. That's the idea in Buddhism. What is a human being? Of course, as Christians, we have a very clear answer. We're creating the image of God. But for Buddhism, human beings do not have a permanent, unchanging soul. In other words, there's no nameable nature of the core of each person. However, this unchanging soul, allegedly, or alleging souls, are an aggregate of five components. That is, here's, here's what you're made up of. A physical body, this is according to Buddhism, you're made up of a physical body, feelings, ideas, dispositions, and consciousness. Okay? So these, you are an aggregate of these five components. So this is what makes up who you are in, in Buddhism. And that's going to be important because the, especially when you think about feelings, ideas, dispositions, and consciousness, those are really where, where you're driving at in Buddhism. So when you, when you get to that, you might start asking questions like, how do we, how do we know that that's what we're composed of? How do we know that uh, our feelings are true, that they're, that they're guiding us correctly. Feelings will often deceive you. Uh, what about our ideas? How do we know those ideas are correct? How do we know that they're based on objective truth? What about dispositions like how, you know, and our, our consciousness? How do we know anything's actually even real then? Of course, we could be deceived if Buddhism is right. Well, we could be deceiving ourselves all the time and not even know it. This is important as we, as we understand this, as we can we kind of push back in because there's something else that's universal about the human experience is that we want to know, and we actually, when you go to kind of the default of the core of the person, is that we we believe that we know. And to say, that's why we make statements. That, In fact, that's when we're living our life every day, it's based on things that we believe. And if you were to say about those beliefs, we say we know those things to be true. You know, for example, you know, I think about this, well, what do, I, what do I know to be true? Well, every day I'm functioning, operating in a world where I believe there's order. If there wasn't order, then how do I know tomorrow I'm going to wake up and that the, you know, there's going to be gravity on the planet, that we're going to be revolving around the sun? I just take these things for granted, and I'm living, even if it's uh, subconsciously, according to these truths. The idea here is that you cannot get someone to truly, in their truest sense, agree that we can't know anything. Because that's a that's a statement. That's a that's a truth claim. So you're saying that you know something. When you say we can't know anything for certain, that, that everything's transient, you just made 
a truth claim. You're saying, I know that we can't know anything. How do you know that? I want you to hit pause here for just a minute, not literally hit pause on the video, but to, to hit pause. This is an important point, especially with Eastern religions. You get this idea, well, you can't, there's no true truth. That's a truth claim. Ask this question, how do you know there's no true truth? How can you know that for sure? Well, because it just depends on how you're looking at it. How do you know that? I think back, I had a, a gentleman give me this illustration years ago. He says, they, uh, he's from an Eastern religion. He said, uh, there's this pure light and it hits the glass. And when it hits the glass, it comes out in different colors. And those different colors are the, are the different religions. And I said, okay, fine. I said, but what if, what if someone had a perspective where they could see on the other side of the glass and could see the pure light? Wouldn't you want them to explain that to you and teach you what that is? And he said, yes. And of course, I believe that the true light um, is the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in John's gospel, uh, he, he, he uses this, this terminology, which I think is beautiful, very appropriate. He says this, uh, I want you to, in him was life. This is John chapter one, verse four. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Jumping down here, he says, he came as a witness to, this is John the Baptist, to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. The Lord Jesus Christ is that light. When we think about light and life, you can't have life without light. And so the idea is that he's, he's simultaneously both. Uh, so I had an opportunity to share the gospel at that moment. How can you know anything? If you're saying, I don't know, how do you know you don't know? Well, no one can know. How do you know that no one can know? Keep going back to that series of questions over and over and over again. All right, so what happens to a person after death in Buddhism? Uh, they reach a the ultimate goal here is reaching a state of nirvana and into which this is important because so nirvana isn't just about the idea of ceasing to exist consciously in the way we understand the conscience. But if you are if you are conscious, then you are engaged in this cycle of, of suffering. And the idea is, is to to remove that and get out of this cycle. So the rebirth is to eliminate all desire. That, that's what has to happen. You have to, in Buddhism, remove yourself from all desire, from all the entanglements of life. Okay, you say, what about relationships? Even that, at the core of Buddhism, is to remove yourself from relationships because Buddhism teaches that you, you, if you love someone, you're in a relationship with someone, there's, there's the potential for suffering. Let's say that person rejects you but ultimately, they would say that relationship, no matter what, will end in suffering because when the person dies, you are suffering, kind of that cause and effect. So the, the goal then would be to remove yourself from those affections because as the Buddha taught, to, to want to be in a relationship, to be loved and loved is a desire. And you have to remove yourself from those desires. So how do you do that? Well, in Buddhism, you have to follow the Eightfold Path, which is usually um, pictured in the wheel, as I've already mentioned. And now there is a kind of a different path in some forms of Buddhism is that you, you become this, this kind of guide, if you will, the spiritual guide who stands on the threshold of like a, like a pure land in pure land Buddhism. And you're there and you don't enter, but you guide others there. And in entering the pure land, which we might think of as heaven, but it's not. But in the pure land, you're able to actually then fully remove yourself from desires and enter in that final state of nirvana. In Buddhism, there's no heaven or hell. One is either reborn or enters nirvana. That's going to be important when we think about this, because we're going to have to talk about objective truth. We're going to have to talk about it. what does it mean to be good? How do we even know that the following that Eightfold Path is good? What if, what if the Eightfold Path is evil? Who, who said it was good? A lot of questions we can ask there. Why is it possible to know anything at all? Well, knowledge is acquired through the senses in Buddhism. Of course, we know this is, our senses can. <laughs> I can tell you this, if, if I'm basing my life purely on feeling, 
I'm probably going to be in trouble. I, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I'm going to run into, I'm going to, I'm going to run into a lot more trouble if, if, if I'm basing my life on feelings versus on facts. And you say, what are facts? Well, based on objective truth. So you see a whole host of issues here. All truth claims in, in Buddhism at its core says all truth claims are to be verified by experience. Of course, when you think about that, I understand that, that truth is being lived out, but our experiences are tainted. In a Christian worldview, we understand our experience or perception is tainted because of, of depravity and sin. So how would, how would we even know? So my experience is a way of verifying a truth claim. How do I know that my experience is a true experience of that so-called truth? How do I know that? How do I know that my experience isn't tainted or warped? Again, I'm asking a lot of questions. All right, number six. How do we know what is right and wrong? I've hammered this already over and over and over. Morality and ethics in Buddhism, are, they're not based on an absolute standard. Everything's in flux and changing. Of course, this is why you might see many who, if you will, take more of a, a far left or left view of of politics, why, why you might see Buddhism being appealing there. I'm not saying that every Buddhist is a leftist or every leftist is a Buddhist. I don't mean that. I've encountered a number of Buddhists who happen to be politically left. They're not. These aren't Asian Buddhists. Uh, these are usually Caucasian Buddhists who've converted to it. Uh, I think it's a convenient religion in the sense of you have religion, yet you're really the ethics and morality is shifting. Why? Because there's no objective standard. So I guess. You're the one choosing the path because you, you're the one creating the path in a sense. You get to create the path, choose the path, uh, but, but how do you know it's the right path? How do you know that you are fulfilling it? Well, I guess you'd have to become uh, the authority. And maybe in a sense, Buddhism allows you to be that. So therefore, morality is based on the idea of living in harmony and with compassion. Of course, you've got this idea of karma that's in Hinduism, but you also you have it here as well, and if the idea is the notion of that one's present fate, pleasure or pain, or place in society is a result of past action, especially in a former existence. You have this idea of rebirth again. And finally, let's wrap it up. What's the meaning of human history? Well, when we're talking about heaven and hell, we're, we're understanding human history to have a beginning and an end, and that the soul is eternal, and that everything in human history is working to a final end, a final point. Well, that means that time, in a sense, isn't real. Why? Because history is cyclical. It's just it's through cycles, ultimately with the goal of ceasing to end. So if, if time isn't propelling us to a sense of eternity, a conscious eternity, then time in itself really isn't real, at least within Buddhism, the way they understand it, because human history really then has no meaning. Think about this similar to Hinduism, that is everything or everyone you've ever loved or pursued, everything you've ever attempted, it's going to mean nothing in the end. It will have no lasting or value, and if it has no lasting value, it has no inherent value. Uh, we see a major flaw here. Well, why love at all? Why, why do good at all? Why pursue anything at all? It, it's all for nothing then. Inherent in the human soul and the human condition is to know that our life has purpose and meaning. I think this is a great opportunity right here where we would be able to share the gospel. Well, just in case you've never heard the gospel, let me just give you a few key high points. There's a holy God who is eternal. He's omniscient. That is, he's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Uh, he is one being who exists in three persons. And we are created in the image of God. However, we rebelled against God. In rebelling against God, we fell into sin and we are born with a sinful nature. We needed a redeemer, so God sent his only begotten son uh, who lived a perfect life that we could not live and who died a death we couldn't die. That is, we couldn't even die for our own sins, let alone someone else's. So he dies for our sins, was buried, re was resurrected on the third day. And if you repent and believe in him, what happens is he takes on your sin on him, so he who knew no sin was made sin. He wasn't a sinner. He wasn't made a sinner, but he took our sins on him, and he transfers to you 
his perfect righteousness, that you might have eternal life. Well, our Lord not only was resurrected, seen by more than 500 witnesses, ascended back to the right hand of the Father, where he makes perpetual intercession for us as we wait for his return when he does away ultimately with the final enemy that is death. Well, until then, there can be no excuses. There will be no surrender and no retreat. Why? Because Jesus Christ is King.